Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. The Trans Mountain Pipeline has the green light. While some pop the champagne, others are up in arms, including B.C. Green Party leader Andrew Weaver, who holds the balance of power in that province. Mr. Weaver, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. What a pleasure uh, being on your show. Thank you. The federal government approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project this week. You've said that you will use every available tool to stop the pipeline. So what's your next step to try to prevent shovels from going in the ground? So in our confidence and supply agreement, as you pointed out, with the BCNDP, it does indeed say that every tool in the toolbox will be used. Now, uh, as this is a collaborative approach to governance on this particular file, uh, what we've been doing right now is discussing with the BCNDP collectively what other steps are available. Uh, we continue to support uh, the BCNDP in their move to bring the uh, test case to the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, sadly, that could have happened right away if the federal government had actually done what the British Columbia government had hoped they would, is go right away to the Supreme Court instead of this initial case. So we support that. We know that there are Indigenous uh, um, communities that are going to continue to uh, fight, and, and, as, and as there are other issues that have been brought to our attention. Uh, the main concern here we have, of course, is that the interests of British Columbians are protected, and in addition, that truth in discourse publicly, nationally, is actually there. There's been far too much political spin, far too little evidence in, in terms of informing the decision-making, and far too much decisions already made seek evidence to justify after the fact involved in what's been going on here with the Trans Mountain. In terms of Premier Horgan, he said that Ottawa appears to be going ahead with this. The BC Court of Appeals has said that the federal government has jurisdiction. I know there's still court cases, but if the Premier right. is willing to allow this pipeline to be ultimately built, are you willing to pull your support from him over that issue? So the Premier has been very clear he will continue to stand up for British Columbians' coastal interests. We continue to support in that regard. The, the three uh, ministers who are most active on this particular file are the Premier, uh, Minister Eby, uh, Attorney General, and Minister Heyman, the Environment Minister. The three ministers and our uh, collective caucus have met numerous times on this topic. We're on the same page. We collectively believe that it is not in British Columbia's interests to put, uh, take all the risk. And frankly, we believe it is not in in Canada's interests to be investing multiple billions of dollars on the technology of the last century, uh, trying to uh, produce a pipeline to deliver a substance to a market that doesn't exist. Uh, we know that market doesn't exist because right now, this year, there has only been one tanker, only one tanker that has left the uh, Westbridge Terminal for Asia. Uh, and this is supposed to have one a day, and we've had one so far this year. The reason why, of course, is that Trans Mountain, when they initially put forward the project to the NEA, be, did so under the assumption of an oil price over $100 a, a barrel and with the expectation that the market was going to be the California market because what was happening is supply was being sought for those refineries. Uh, we've had a revolution in shale uh, technology and the discovery of the back and fields and the substantive uh, cheap uh, oil coming out has really muted the uh, ability of both Alaska crude as well as British Columbia heavy oil to actually find market, not only in America, but it's very low value value product because of its high sulfur content, because it's, it has to be upgraded so much, and it's expensive to get to wherever it needs to be. So we believe this is fiscally reckless, and not only that, it's, it's um, Mr. Trudeau has, has continued to try to spin this as somehow good for clean energy. I mean, it, it's ironic that he would have a climate emergency uh, a, a announcement the day before approving a pipeline. In fact, that headline by itself made the headline of the Beaverton, but it's actually what happened. That shows how outrageous it is. But there are business analysis that show that we're not ready to get off of fossil fuels and that there is still demand. And the Alberta market has had a problem with trying to get the oil out. And it's that problem of moving oil that's still happening. So does that mean that you'd prefer to move it another way, by rail instead of by pipeline? So that's incorrect. The argument there is a fallacy. That is the foundation of the rhetoric that has been put out. Alberta claims it needs its, its product to get to Tide. Well, what we have to do is ask the question, why is it that the export of diluted bitumen out of Burnaby Terminal has collapsed in recent years? And it's collapsed. Uh, it's been going on for quite some time. It's be collapsed because the market doesn't exist. And the market that did exist, which was the California market, is gone because of the back in shales. There's a reason why Kinder Morgan bailed from this project. They bailed from it because they saw the writing on the wall. The market for diluted bitumen, it is not oil. 
Let's be very clear. Well, in fairness, they said they weren't confident the pipeline was going to be approved. Well, I mean, that is, that's a very good story. I, and I, all I can say is I'm, I, I have a lot of respect for the uh, senior management of Kinder Morgan who were able to protect shareholder value and get the government to, to basically uh, fall across the, the finish line uh, in, a, in a, frankly, incompetent manner to bail them out of a bad investment. That's really what's at stake here. And the federal government uh, is to claim that somehow we're going to have clean energy being supported here actually assumes that we're going to make money on this. I don't see how we can because the price for Alaska, for Alberta oil at 25 bucks, a little lower than the, than the say the, the uh, regular crude. Uh, if, if there were such a market of it today, why is it that we're not shipping any of it to Asia other than one tanker all of this year? That's because there isn't a market. And part of that reason is because high sulfur uh, bunker fuels are being phased out in the marine shipping industry as we move. It's not because of a lack of pipelines. No, there's no, we have an existing pipeline. We have an existing pipeline for which product, if there were a market for high value product, would have been used. If someone was willing to pay $50, $60 a barrel for Alberta Michigan, today they could place an order and they could deliver into that from the, Alberta, the Westbridge terminal. That could happen today, but it hasn't happened. There has been one such order from China. It is utter nonsense and fiscal recklessness to believe that somehow this investment is going to get, bring money to, to, be, to, to Canada. It's all about political games as Trudeau tried to play horse trading with Miss Notley in order to get carbon pricing and with Miss Clark in order to get Site C and LNG Canada approved. You know, this is, this is shocking, actually. It's what breeds cynicism in the Canadian public about our political discourse. And if we had an honest discussion, we would actually recognize that it is not economically uh, viable today. And you don't have to believe me. Talk to David Anderson, the former minister of Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who essentially said as much in a recent editorial here in the Times column. There are people who oppose the project and they say they're planning civil disobedience, like chaining themselves to fences and pipelines. Yes. Do you endorse that as a way to stop the pipeline? We, as a... As a political party, I understand that each individual citizen has a responsibility that they wish to abide by. Uh, as a political party, you will not see me standing up and, 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 and condoning nor participating in civil de disobedience. I don't believe, as a, as a lawmaker, it behooves me as a, such a person to actually break said law. However, I understand that in times of, 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 of strife, people find different ways uh, of expressing themselves. I'm very worried about how this is going to end up. I am very worried because people have not been heard, because the rhetoric that has been sold to Canadians is a rhetoric that doesn't hold up to scrutiny, and people are not stupid. You know, had we had a, a fair and open and honest discussion that the reason why this pipeline is being built is solely because we're worried about Alberta, we, we, and, and we're trying to appease Albertans and polit the politics in Alberta, maybe that's one thing. But to be told that there's this great market for it, to be told that we need it to invest in clean energy, to be told that somehow this is good for the Canadian economy, it's all nonsense. Look, Stat Oil, uh, Total, uh, uh, Shell, BP, numerous multinationals have pulled out of the about Alberta oil sands already. They've divested themselves from that, not because they don't need oil, but because it is some of the most expensive and, and frankly, dirtiest oil on the planet. We're not talking about shipping Alberta crude. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about shipping... Uh, uh, back in shale oil. We are talking about shipping diluted bitumen, a low value product, high sulfur contact that needs substantial upgrading. And if we really cared about the economy and jobs here in the province, what we would be doing is we'd be doing what Elizabeth May, our federal Libra leader, has pointed out, is we should be refining locally. Because there is a domestic market for local refined products that we could meet, and we're not. And that is a shame, and that's what we should be focusing on. Because race for the bottom economics, to continue to do what we've been doing for decades and think we're going to get somehow a different result is not going to work out. Mr. Lougheed in Alberta saw the future. He recognized that there were wealthy times, and he created the Alberta Heritage Fund, which was a legacy that he left for Albertans that was squandered by irresponsible 
responsible conservative management of that province in the years that followed. To now somehow think that we're going to continue down that path to being wealth and prosperity, uh, I can imagine Mr. Lawhi turning over in his grave as he had set Alberta up to position themselves for tomorrow, and now they're trying to scramble to catch up when they could have been in a position leading the growth of our economy rather than chasing the kind of economy of the early 20th century. What are we going to start talking about now? We're going to talk about you know coal mines again. L literally, the rest of the world is moving on, and, it's, and I think Canada behooves us to do so as well. Well, there have been some groups online discussing destroying infrastructure, actually attacking the pipeline, taking this to the level of damaging that infrastructure and even possibly violence. Is that something that you're concerned about? And what would you say to people who are considering taking those actions? I, I'm very concerned uh, about this. Uh, I, I, of course, I, I don't condone any of this. Uh, my colleagues, we don't condone this. But we understand the level of frustration that exists in British Columbia in particular for people. I mean, look. I, particip I can show you my own frustration. I participated as an intervener. My office and I spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours in the initial intervention process. We sp uh, scanned all 10,000 pages, submitted hundreds upon hundreds of questions, waited for answers, and got none. So much so that a simple example that I'll give you here was dismissed as not being important. The example was this. I asked simply that if a more credible uh, oil spill response could be put forward in light of the fact that the entire submission to the NEB was predicated on the existence of 20 hours of sunlight. Well, I can tell you there's no latitude south of Tuk to Yuk Tuk at, that gets 20 hours of sunlight on any day of the year, any year, any year in the, in the century. That's a problem. So I simply asked the question, could we please have more realistic scenarios with your oil spill response done when we actually have realistic amounts of daylight available? Numbers change when you actually have real assumptions instead of fake assumptions. I was told, no, the NEB have enough on which to raise a decision. That comment was never addressed once. Yet that is a foundation. If, if, if I had a term paper submitted to me while I was a student, uh, you know, at the university from an undergraduate student doing an oil spill response on, 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 uh, suggesting that this was good, and I said to them, well, there's no, there's no, there's no, you, your, your assumption of 20 hours of sunlight is, is, is not, doesn't hold up. They would probably not pass that assignment. Yet somehow national decisions on the, on the scale of billions upon billions of dollars are being made when information like that is on which it is based. It's shocking. It's scandalous. And frankly, I think Canadians deserve better. And so I understand why people are frustrated. Oh, I very much understand. I'm frustrated. I don't condone the, the, the actions that you says might, might occur. But, 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 you know, it's not as if people have not been warning that, that, that people are frustrated out in this province. I think in the short term, and you can see that from the recent ECOS polls when you see that the federal Green Party in British Columbia is now polling above the federal Liberals and almost twice what the federal NDP are polling in this province of British Columbia. That really is a testament to how concerned people are here about the nonsense that we've been sold as a bill of goods in this province. But the most recent poll showed that 60% of British Columbians support Trans Mountain. So a, a lot of the, 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 it depends on the question. So again, um, if you ask the question, where is the support for Trans Mountain? You will find in British Columbia that it is less of a concern for people in the interior of British Columbia. I'm, I say that generally. Obviously, the Camus nations are very concerned. They've, they've spoken strongly against it. But there are others, you know, more generally who are less concerned because it doesn't affect their backyard. You come to the city of Vancouver. Vancouver, the wor a city that's trying to brand itself as the greenest city in the world by 2020, and you try to turn it into one of the largest exporters of heavy oil in a precarious kind of coastal environment where they have to go through the, through the uh, Iron Workers Bridge every day and the entire harbor must shut down as these tankers leave and enter, you, you, you know, there's profound concern there. So if the Liberals think they're going to win seats on Vancouver Island or in Greater Vancouver, yeah, they've got something coming to them. If they, I, I would suspect, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were wiped out of Metro Vancouver and Vancouver Island. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a substantive increase in the number of federal greens. And the ECOS poll released yesterday or the day before shows 24% polling in, in, in the province of British Columbia by the federal greens, and the federal liberals only 22% and the BCNDP in the low teens. Remarkable numbers. And that's a direct consequence of, 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 of the British Columbians witnessing the, the hypocritical behavior of our federal politicians. What do you say to people who say the federal government has to balance jobs in Alberta and the environment in BC? 80,000 jobs lost, Alberta saying they're dying because they can't get the energy out, and that the federal government is trying to strike a balance here. 
It's not about balancing out. Look, I, I would suggest that Mr. Trudeau needs to go back and read the Lorax. It's a very simple kids book that talks about balancing in the environment and the economy. Uh, it's not as simple as that. Mr. Trudeau has, a, you, you balance the environment and the economy by recognizing that you don't have a strong economy without a strong environment. Mr. Kenny continuing to think that somehow building a pipeline is gonna create a market. It's, it's, it's outrageous. I mean. What free market exists where you build something and it will come? Nobody does that. This is one of the reasons, probably the substantive reason why Kinder Morgan walked. There is no market right now for high sulfur laden diluted bitumen. That's the reason why it's trading at $25 a, a barrel. But then why is there a glut? Because study after study in Alberta has said that the problem is with being able to get the oil out. Not a lack of demand, but a lack of being able to supply it. Well, uh, uh, the counter to that, I mean, you can quote industry study after industry study and rhetoric after rhetoric who will say that. And, but what you're not quoting is study after study, which are saying the exact opposite. And I'll give you the direct numbers. One tanker, one tanker has left Vancouver for China this year, one. But the price is 25 bucks. If there was such a market, there is no reason why today they could not be shipping already with the existing pipeline to Asian markets. They're not, because there isn't a market. That is the problem. And the refinery in, in Burnaby is not getting the product it needs to refine. That pipeline is under, underused in terms of, and, it's, and they're dumping into the, into the Sumus market um, in, in the US. This, this is the problem. There is no mysterious Chinese market. It's just, it's, a, it's literally smoke and mirrors. So, so uh, this is the problem we're having, is you're trying to squeeze water from a stone, and when it doesn't happen, rather than walking away, you try to squeeze harder. It's like watching the Nortel stock drop from over $100 to 70 and thinking, great deal, I'll buy twice as much, and then watching it go into $20 and buying more, and then watching it at $2 and thinking you have a hell of a deal, and then wondering why you're bankrupt when you're stuck with a bunch of paper that you doubled down on, throwing good money after bad, and you end up with nothing. And that's exactly the path we're heading on now. Now, I recognize that Alberta has historically got an oil economy. Now is the time, they, now is a time that they should be diversifying because the reality is the world is decarbonizing. Whether Alberta likes it or not, the rest of the world is. You can go kicking and screaming and try to hang on to the 20th century or you can be left behind. I would like Alberta to be leaders in innovation in the new economy. I wish they were because I know they got the talent and the people there to do that. And one of the ways you do that is by not chasing the past, by fo focusing on the future. It is frankly too late for arguments like, oh, we need this, uh, we need this to invest in clean energy. Those arguments may have been valuable at the time of Peter Lougheed. They may have been uh, legitimate and compelling arguments in the early 1990s. They are not now. We're at 20, almost 2019. The IPCC has quite clearly pointed out that we are going to blow through the two degrees and one degrees target very soon if we don't get our act together in the next decade. Now, I think that it is irresponsible for us to not uh, follow the leadership that particularly the youth of today who will have to inherit this mess have to uh, uh, are, are crying out for. We have to wrap it up there, Mr. Weaver. Thank you very much for joining us. What a pleasure uh, being on your show. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson. Thanks for joining us.